Hello friends, and welcome to our unit on electrons. So before we get too far into it, let's go back to the organizational course presentation and kind of see where we are in the overall scheme. So if we remember, our overall theme for the year is that matter is made of atoms that interact in interesting ways. And so in our last unit, we went in and we started our view of the atom by going in and looking at the nucleus and nuclear chemistry. Now we're going to come out and we're going to focus on the electron. We're going to look at some brief history of atomic models, which is really a history of how we've thought about electrons more than anything else. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, electromagnetic radiation and some discussion of how we represent electrons in our atomic models. So I hope that that sounds like an interesting time for you. And uh, yeah, let's get into it. So we're going to begin by looking at the history of atomic models and how our understanding of atoms has changed over time. So before we do, let's talk a little bit about these two terms. So science and technology or science and applied science, if you want to think about it that way. There is a feedback loop that exists between science and technology. So science leads to advances in technology, and then those advances in technology lead to additional advances in science. Both benefit each other. It's what we call a positive feedback loop in systems thinking. So it's just a good thing to understand. You're going to see that happening over the course of this discussion. You're going to see that advances in uh, technology have led to advances of our understanding of what the atom does actually look like. So we're going to start back in ancient Greece and we're going to look at a group of philosophers which were known as the atomists. Here is one particular atomist, Democritus. These folks are noteworthy because they are the first ones who thought that there was some small, indestructible, fundamental unit of any substance. Atom comes from the Greek for atomos, which just means indivisible, and it's sort of the fundamental unit. And what's interesting about the atomists is that they based their model on nothing. They just based it on thinking. They, they looked at the world around them and they decided that there had to be some sort of fundamental unit to the matter that they saw around them, below which you really could not get any further. This was not, of course, the only school of thought on the subject, but they happen to be the ones that history has vindicated at least as much as any of them were vindicated by history. But this notion that, yeah, maybe there were in fact small, fundamental, indivisible units of matter is pretty much where the subject stood for the next 2,000 years. And it wasn't really until we get to England in the beginning of the 1800s, and maybe Europe more generally in that period of time, that we're talking about evidence that actually supports supports the notion that there are in fact atoms. And so uh, John Dalton is the one who usually gets credit for this model of the atom. But of course, we should recognize that even though we like to say that this is one person's model of the atom, it's of course the work of many different scientists. It just happens over sort of historical progression to get pinned on one particular scientist. So this is the Dalton model of the atom, and that's that atoms are the smallest part of any substance, but that different elements are made out of different types of atoms. So this is a representation of what this might look like. Here we have copper atoms making up a copper penny, and you can see that they're all being represented here as spheres of the same color and the same dimensions. That's sort of the Dalton-esque model of the atom. What's interesting about Dalton is that he based this model on simple mathematics from experiments that he was doing and that other people were doing, looking at the masses that were used and produced in different kinds of chemical reactions. Let's take a look at some of that evidence. One of the major pieces of evidence actually doesn't come from Dalton. It comes from a French chemist, Joseph Proust, who came up with this notion of the law of definite proportions. And that's this idea that elements always combine to form a compound in a fixed whole number ratio. So here is a particular compound. This compound is called isooctane. And if you look at the ratio of carbon and hydrogen by mass in different amounts of isooctane, you're gonna see something kind of interesting. So no matter what mass you use, you're always gonna get a carbon to hydrogen mass ratio of 5.33 to one. It's always going to be the same. And that is this law of definite proportions. In isooctane, the mass ratio of carbon to hydrogen is always going to be 5.33 to one. If we had a different compound, like methane for instance, that mass ratio would be different. But again, no matter what mass we took, the ratio of carbon to hydrogen in a different compound would always be the same value. Dalton takes that and he extends it. So he comes up with this notion of the law of multiple proportions. And that's this idea that elements combine to form different compounds in fixed whole number ratios. Here are two different compounds that are made out of copper and chlorine. So you've got copper one chloride and you've got copper 
2 chloride. And you can probably see by looking at this diagram that the ratio of copper atoms to chlorine atoms is different in these two compounds. And so what Dalton does is he looks at the masses that are produced when you break apart these two different compounds. And so for instance, in copper one chloride, if you break a certain amount of it apart, you'll get a mass of one gram of copper to 1.116 grams of chlorine. So that's a ratio of one to 1.116. And if you look at copper two chloride and you break that apart, you'll get one gram of copper for every 0 0.558 grams of chlorine. So that's a ratio of one to 0.558. And what's really interesting is if you compare these two ratios to each other, you're actually going to get a one to two ratio. And so that's again, this notion of the law of multiple proportions, that elements combine to form different compounds in different, but still fixed whole number ratios. And that gives the sort of mathematical support that we need to understand that there is something fundamental about these different compounds that really can't be reduced any further. These atoms are always going to combine in these fixed whole number ratios. And so Dalton writes this up. He writes a book in 1808, and this is his notation that he uses. And you can see that he's thinking about the different types of elements as small spheres, but that he's representing the different spheres in different ways to demonstrate that there is in fact something different about the different elements in the way that they are comprised and what they're made of. We go a hundred years into the future, we get to England again, we look at 1897, we have this model from J.J. Thompson, which is called the plum pudding model. And so the plum pudding model states that the atom is a sphere of positive charge with negatively charged electrons stuck inside of it. This is a picture of an English food called plum pudding. And so you can think about the plum pudding as having these plums stuck inside of it. I like to think about it as the chocolate chip cookie model of the atom where the electrons are the chocolate chips inside of the cookie. And so this is what we might represent the Thomson model of the atom to look like if we wanted to draw it. And Thomson's evidence for this is cathode rays. So cathode rays were discovered sometime before Thomson started looking at them. And this is what a cathode ray tube looks like. So you've got a way where you can apply a current to it and that's going to produce a beam called a cathode ray. This is a cathode ray tube before any current has been applied. And then when we apply current to it, you can see this beam of cathode rays. And what's interesting is that these cathode rays respond to magnetic fields so that they are attracted towards the positive pole and repelled from the negative pole, which tells us that these cathode rays are negatively charged. But there's no atoms inside of a Crookes tube outside of the apparatus of the tube itself. There's a vacuum inside of there. And so Thompson says these particles have to be coming from inside of the atoms and attempts to figure out the mass of these particles led to them being demonstrated to be considerably less than the mass of the lightest elements. And so Thompson says these are subatomic particles that make up these cathode rays, which he calls electrons. And we now know, of course, are negatively charged subatomic particles. The Thompson model of the atom is not really all that fleshed out. And in 1911, Ernest Rutherford, the famous Ernest Rutherford, uh, refines that model further. And he says that the positive charge is not a cloud in the atom, that is actually all stored inside of the middle of the atom in a very dense, very small space. And the experiment that he does to demonstrate this, or that actually his grad students do to demonstrate this, is called the gold foil experiment. And this is an incredibly important experiment in chemistry and in particle physics. It sort of signifies the beginning of particle physics. So let's go in and take a look at how this experiment works. So what Rutherford's students wind up doing is they take a very, very, very thin sheet of gold gold atoms, and they surround it with a phosphorescent screen. And so this phosphorescent screen will give off a glow anytime a particle hits it. They then take a source of alpha particles, an alpha emitter, and they point it at the gold sheet. So they just start firing alpha particles at the gold sheet. These alpha particles come out incredibly, incredibly fast, and they look at what happens. So by looking at the pattern of light that's produced on the phosphorescent screen, they can see where the particles wind up. And it turns out that most of the alpha particles go straight through the foil, but every once in a while gets repelled. It actually comes back almost 180 degrees. You can see that on this diagram. And this is the conclusive sort of disproof of the Thompson model. 
The notion here being that if the Thomson model were correct and the atom was just a diffuse cloud of positive charge, the alpha particles would basically just go straight through. They might be deflected slightly as they interacted with the electrons, but they should all go through without any sort of real deviation from that. But because you have most of them going through, but them being deflected also in these kind of scattered patterns, even some coming straight back, that means that the alpha particles, these positively charged particles traveling incredibly fast, have to be hitting something in that gold atom that is causing them to be to be deflected. And so that thing has to be pretty massive itself and it has to be positively charged to repel the alpha particles. Now, most of the particles are going straight through. So that actually leads Rutherford to conclude that the atom is actually mostly empty space, but that there is something positively charged in the middle of the atom, which is of course the atomic nucleus. And as a result, Rutherford and his students are credited with the discovery of the proton, one of the major fundamental subatomic particles. If we go forward a little bit more in time, we get to Denmark, 1913. Uh, this gentleman here, Niels Bohr, he refines this model further. The Rutherford model has the electrons around the nucleus, but nobody really knows about their locations. And Bohr says that in fact, the electrons are not just found anywhere around the nucleus, that they're found in specific orbits. And since these are orbiting the nucleus, this is called the planetary model. And so you can see this model here, the electrons can only be found in these specific places. And his evidence for this is the light that's given off by heating of different elements. Bohr heats hydrogen, for instance, and what he sees when he looks at the light that's produced from heating a sample of hydrogen is the spectrum that we see down below the entire spectrum up above here. He only gets these specific wavelengths of light produced. And he's actually able to make the connection here and say the reason that I'm only getting the specific wavelengths of light produced here is because those electrons can only go in specific locations around the nucleus. So when they release their energy, they're only releasing specific or quantized amounts of energy. Bohr's model is then refined further over the rest of the 20th century into what we now call the wave mechanical model. This model again looks at the location of the electrons and it says that the electrons aren't really orbiting the nucleus, but instead they're confined to three dimensional areas of space, which are called orbitals. The model over here is showing you what these orbitals look like. They're just regions where we are most likely to find a particular electron at any one period of time. The electron itself actually can be described both as a wave and as a particle, which is a quantum characteristic of the electron known as its duality. And furthermore, you can't actually ever know an electron's location or its position and its velocity or where it's going simultaneously. And the more you learn about one, the less information you get about the other, which is why these regions of space have to be defined as regions of probability or regions where we're most likely to find an electron at any particular moment in time. We can't actually know where it is. What we see here are the different orbitals. And remember that these orbitals are just regions of three-dimensional space surrounding the nucleus. So you can think about the nucleus at the middle of these intersections and and these are the representations of the different orbitals, which we'll talk about quite a bit more in future discussions in this unit. Important to understand here at the end that the progression of models is the progression of thought in what the atom looks like over time. And so we've gone from the Dalton model to the Thompson plum pudding model to the Rutherford model to Bohr's planetary model. And our modern model is this wave mechanical model. But I really want you to understand that old models are not useless. It's easy to think that an old model becomes useless because it is demonstrated not to be as accurate as a more recent model. And that's a true statement. It is not as accurate, but it is still not useless, particularly to us. So up to this point in this course, with the exception of nuclear chemistry, we've really been considering atoms at basically a Dalton-esque level, just considering different atoms as small spheres. And we're actually gonna go back to that later on in this course because we really don't need to think about what's happening inside of the atom to really get a handle on how the atoms are interacting with each other, with the exception of the behavior of particular groups of the electrons in the atom. So we can continue to think about them as sort of Dalton-esque spheres. Similarly, the Bohr model is very helpful to us thinking about the electron progressing from orbit to orbit uh, when we want to think about how light is produced. This is not a bad thing. Every model is by definition a simplified version of reality. It wouldn't be useful to us if it didn't make certain simplifications. It's totally okay to use more simplified models of reality to help to investigate how reality works. We always should just pause and recognize the fact that they are in fact simplifications. Thanks so much for watching this video. Make sure that you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure that you can describe the major features of each of the atomic models discussed in this presentation. Make sure that you can explain the evidence that supports each of the atomic models that we've discussed in this presentation. 
And finally, make sure that you can explain why different models of the atom are useful for different purposes in chemistry. If you can do each of those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment here and write down any questions that you have. You can always get in touch with me through the comments below the video or through the information in the info field. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.